Jill. How are you doing? Great. Thanks, oh, Lori. Great to see you. And, and, and I'm so excited that you're here because you are bringing something really important to the table. It's actually the theme of this whole summit, and that is about using your business as a voice for uh, the ocean, for planet, our blue planet Earth that we have. And, and that's, that's why I, I, I'm, I'm so thrilled to have you is because people need to see how people's business models have moved from one thing into something much greater, um, having a huge impact when, uh, when it, it started out in something quite uh, an interesting thing to do, fun thing to do, and all of a sudden it became this, this incredible platform and, and opened up all sorts of opportunities. So let's talk about your big project right now, We Are Water. Just go into that. Sure. My husband and I started the We Are Water project, and it was really a result of, of you know, feeling a little reflective as I, as I age and, and thinking about all the incredible opportunities that I've had to dive around the world, explore our planet on unique projects that have taken me to see things that nobody's ever seen before. And as I looked back on that history and exploration, I realized that I keep seeing the same lessons as I travel around the world, that not everybody really understands where their water comes from and how they can be inadvertently overusing it or polluting it. And I realize that where I dive inside of caves is truly the beginning of the pipe. So I think we have to protect the beginning of the pipe. Every drop of rain that lands on the sur surface of the earth soaks into the ground, whether that's through you know cave passages that I can swim through or whether it's just in between grains of sand, it ends up as groundwater. But that groundwater comes back to the surface again. After it's traveled through the, the ground, it pops to the surface in springs. And those springs may feed a river, fuel an estuary, and eventually flow out to the ocean. And if we don't protect the beginning of the pipe, um, all the land-based activities before they pollute our water resources, then the ocean doesn't really have any hope either. So I realized that my explorations allowed me to go places where I could use my voice like the canary in the coal mine. I could see how things that happened on the surface of the earth were affecting the water way back at the beginning of the pipe and maybe help people understand a little bit better about how their lives are intertwined with water. And I call that water literacy because here in America, most people, if I ask them, where does your water come from? They'll say the faucet in the house and they don't understand their groundwater resources. So if I can help them connect that if they pour oil on the landscape, thinking it's just going to soak into the ground and go away, that it's not going to go away, that it can affect things as far away as the ocean and dolphins and beautiful things that they enjoy seeing. Wow. So, so tell us about you, um, when, you, when you did your, your, your project. It's a, there's a film involved in this. And what are, the, what are some of the things that came up for you that really hit you in the face that, that made you go, oh my gosh, we really need to get out this film out in a big way? Yeah. Well, um, we did create a short documentary film um, just under an hour so it would fit into a good presentation schedule for people. Uh, but really the roots of the film started for me, I, I think, with some big revelations during exploration in the 90s. You know, in... In 1996, I was in central Mexico exploring a cave system that winds its way through waterfalls and sumps through the mountains. And yet the people living on top of that mountain had one person in the family whose soul, sorry, the phone's ringing. <laughs> we'll just let it ring. So um, the people that lived in the mountains had um, one person in the family unit whose sole responsibility was to fetch water every day. And yet they were sitting on top of this huge resources that were running its way you know, through the mountains. They were also um, you know, disposing of their own wastes in ways that they didn't realize were affecting the water supply of the guy just a few feet down the hill, basically. So in the late 90s, I was involved in the three-dimensional mapping. Um, the first time this had ever been done in high-level accuracy in, in Florida. And 
we were not just mapping the cave itself in three dimensions, but locating precisely where it was beneath the ground. So you could literally walk over the surface of the ground through Wakulla Springs State Park and know that you were standing directly on top of drinking water conduits. For me, as a cave diver, it represented the first time that water managers started to care about what I was doing. So prior to that, as cave divers, we would submit our maps to the water management people in the state of Florida, and they would go, oh, okay, well, this is kind of interesting, but it's not very useful to us. But for the first time, with, with this level of accuracy and scientific certainty, they could see exactly where the cave conduits lay and we could start to define a spring shed and a watershed and an area of influence that affected the groundwater beneath. And for me, that was really a part of the genesis where I thought, wow, what I do has, it's, it's important. I'm not a scientist. I'm schooled in fine arts and yet I dabble in science every day with what I do. But finally, my, my information was important, important to the scientific world, to hydrogeologists who could better understand their resources too. And from then on, there was no turning back. Um, that was really the basis of, of my own sense of responsibility as an environmental advocate. I couldn't just sit on this information. I had to share it far and wide. And, and I've slowly worked towards finding a way to better share that with the public, not just with water managers, but with anybody that's willing to listen. And, and that's how Robert and I started the We Are Water project. It's not a foundation. It's just something that we do and focus our attention to to give us real meaning for our work. So whenever I travel, I talk to kids at a school or present to people in a big auditorium or, or sit in a cafe and give a presentation. Um, so wherever we can do it, whenever we can do it, we've created films. And most recently, just this week, I finished a children's book that I'm going to release. Yeah. And, um, you know, whatever we can do to, to spread the message and spread the connection with water. Well, you know, it's I, when I was at the Blue Film Festival in November, and it was Celine um, Cousteau that was talking about, you know, you, you do adventure films, or you used to do adventure films. You're, they're still adventure films, but um, the trend now is that people aren't, um, they're interested in adventure, but um, they really want to know what they can do. Because, uh, she she was so eloquent in how she, she spoke to this, and that... Um, uh, it, it's not enough anymore uh, to just show an, an incredible experience because the audience is now left wanting. Um, and so to really de deliver on your films, you really need to give actions that people can do. And, and I think this goes for business as well, and particularly our business. Um, it's not enough anymore to just give people pretty experiences and they can check it on their list. And it's clearly not enough because people are going all, not just diving, they're doing all sorts of things and just getting uh, you know, these experiences, but they want to do more. And where they really plug in is what you're talking about. Is like you're a citizen scientist, right? You're, you're using your business, you're collecting all this valuable data that most scientists can't get at because they're not skilled at what you do. And they're not, they don't have their heads in caves all the time like you do. They don't have the wealth of experience that you do. And, and so you bring to bear something, even though you're not a scientist, you bring a perspective that is invaluable uh, to, to a, a broader stage, a broader audience, and, and, a, and a truly valuable perspective in terms of how to, do, how to manage our water systems. And this is the kind of message I, I'm... I'm I, I believe is getting across uh, to people in our industry because there's people like you who, who are doing this and at, at such a level, I mean, you're, you're just, you're, you're, you feel the responsibility to do this. Absolutely, absolutely. But you know, the good news is, is that technology and social media have enabled a, you know, a global paradigm shift. I can talk to people in China, I can talk to people in Slovenia, we can share experiences, we can share ideas, and we now have a voice that can reach globally if we choose to use it. 
the good news is that, like you say, you know, people want to be responsible. You know, nobody wants to pollute, but sometimes they just don't know how they might be unintentionally overusing resources or, or causing pollution issues. And, and so we have this power, this power to communicate through, you know, my own, you know, projects and in, involvement over the, the last couple of decades in, in expeditions, I've, you know, learned a lot myself. So when I built my own house here in North Florida, I, you know, I couldn't ignore the things that I'd learned. I needed to be responsible. I couldn't have a manicured green lawn like a golf course because that's just irresponsible in this karst, you know, porous environment that I live in. We have to have natural plantings and let things grow that want to grow because you can't use fertilizers and pesticides on the ground. So I learned those things and when I went to build my own house I, I had to you know walk the walk, talk the talk and, and, and happily do so and embrace that new information as I think that people will if they just know what their impacts are. So this is a thing that, that keeps coming up in conversation, and that is that um, talking about these, these issues that are so big, um, talking about these issues is bad for business. And Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you, for you, you know it's not bad for business. No, well, I mean, let's, let's look at, uh, I guess, a more holistic look at business, you know. I still don't know where the next paycheck comes from half the time. <laughs> you know, we live a humble existence. We try to grow our own vegetables. You know, some of that's out of uh, our environmental ethic and our desire to, you know, eat local food. But it's also, it, it's also a financial imperative. You know, I try to live with as little footprint as possible. I'm trying to, you know, reduce, reuse, and recycle. I'm trying to get rid of a lot of stuff in my life and sort of free my myself up. So, so when you say good for business, you know, I don't, I don't want to be bigger. I, I made the most money in my life at probably 21, 22 years old when I had a successful advertising company. But I chose a different path that is giving me a lot more, um, you know, I, I do what I'm passionate for. And there's so much more reward to that. So I don't want to grow my business huge. I'd like to, you know, have enough that I don't have to panic <laughs> about where the next paycheck comes from. But, um, but yeah, you know, we're leading an okay existence, but we're living a great life in a way that's much more harmonious with, with our world. And that fulfills me more than anything else. Yeah. And I think this is, this is a, a really important point is, um, is how we're measuring what success is. And, and it's becoming pretty clear with what the scientists are saying and what the documentary filmmakers are saying or showing um, through, through their work, through your work, that um, our, our system for measuring success is not working because it's all about growth. And uh, we're, we're growing so much that we're just eating up the planet. All the resources are being eaten up and polluted. Um, there's no control over what goes in the water or what goes in the air, or very little control. So we're 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 now we're getting to to crisis stage. There's there's no doubt about that. It's um, uh, but uh, people like yourself um, and me, um, I was never into the corner office thing either. And uh, for you, what you're saying is that um, the metric that is most important to you is to not be worried about the wolf at the door, but more importantly, to be um, just enjoying the contribution and the fulfillment that you get from doing this, this work that is your passion. Absolutely. No question. And, and I think most people would say that too. It, it, it's scary if you live in the corporate world to leave that behind, <laughs> you know, go out on a wing and a prayer. And I'm not saying that's for everybody at all. But, um, uh, but when you do what you love, it, it all kind of comes naturally. And I think it's a little easier to, to make choices that allow you to live in, in, you know, connection with the environment a little bit better. But you know, I look to even really large companies like, let's say, you know, Patagonia. There's a great corporate example. That's a huge company, yet they've um, chosen a really unique path where they've 
certainly put a huge investment in land conservation. But if you go to their website and you go and try to buy clothes from them, the first thing they're going to say on their website is, don't buy this from us. <laughs> and here's sources where you can buy our clothes used. So they send you straight to an opportunity to, to buy used Patagonia clothes. Um, they don't profit from that. Um, and then if you look at the clothes that they do produce new, they try and do that as responsibly as possible with a low water footprint, low carbon impact. They trace, you know, the origins of their down right back to, you know, the beginnings. And, and they have a real open concept. And I think that openness is something, um, again, that kind of comes from the paradigm shift in social media and accessibility of information. And I... I think that the more companies that run in that kind of open philosophy, um, the better. Really. Yeah. You know, they, they did a study, um, it was quite a famous study, but it, unfortunately these studies don't get to the people who really need to hear them. Um, back in 93, they started to track uh, 180 um, big companies um, to see uh, how they, how they would, would fare um, as some of them started to shift over a much more uh, corporate uh, corporate uh, responsibility um, model, uh, sustainable model, thinking about, you know, your footprint, your how you in interact with the society that you, you work with and work through. And, and those that, um, like Patagonia was on their list, mm -hmm. uh, that, that really had a vision, had a passion, had a vision for how they wanted to um, interact with their whole environment, all their stakeholders, those ones are still going. Um, and they have a higher value um, than than those that didn't. Mm -hmm. So it, it is it is an interesting thing, and, and we don't talk about it enough, and that's why we're talking about it here. Uh, but it goes right back to what where you're coming from is that you had you had a business, but you also had a passion, and so you went into you went into diving. I know you were in Cayman when I was there. Yeah. And, and, and 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 then you got really involved in the whole the whole cave side of things, which is hugely adventuresome. And then now you you took the next big step was into really understanding how um, it, you could follow your passion and actually have an impact because you felt the need for responsibility. And now um, people are recognizing what you're doing, and you're attracting all kinds of. Um, attention and awards I'm saying this not you um, uh, that are really quite quite phenomenal when we were talking at, at the beneath the sea uh, show you told me that you're involved in this book and my jaw dropped I'm like oh my <laughs> gosh so please tell please tell everybody this book I can't it's amazing Oh, it's a wonderful new book called Global Chorus, and it's 365 voices all united with a, a better vision for the future. And everyone from Jane Goodall to the Dalai Lama <laughs> have um, put excerpts in this book about, about their vision. And fortunately, I was invited to uh, participate and uh, give a small um a small contribution of, of information from, from We Are Water and my feelings about swimming inside the veins of Mother Earth. <laughs> yeah. well, I, you know, I, I think I, this, is, this is my belief. My belief is that um, our industry thinks that we're, we're small and we really, um, we're, we really can't make an impact. And uh, from the people that I'm speaking to, like yourself and many others who are in who are in the dive industry, but but also because of your passion and your 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 sense of vision and your sense of a need to contribute and and your sense of fulfillment is not not just from money, but it is from this this broader view, this holistic view of how we live and interact in our environment. Um, you are the people that I um, are, are the models, the, you guys are the models for uh, a business that will be run um, and be seen as being truly impactful. So I, I look at you, you're, you're doing this and now you're in this book with 365 people including the Dalai Lama and Jane Goodall. Then I look at somebody like Stefan Gosling 
who came from, he took ecology, he took economics, he took all these things, he was a diver, then he got into marine tourism, and now he's like a UN expert on climate change. He's in from the dive industry. You're from the dive industry. Like, the, you know, this is the kind of impact we have because of our, our, our perspective and our unique perspective. And though we may be small in number, and you know we don't contribute billions of dollars to the economy the reality is we have a huge impact if we're willing to um, say something absolutely and it starts with every young diver the way i look at the diving community is i think we are the ambassadors we are the ones who have an opportunity to tell people about what's going on so i i tell all my cave diving students you know every time you go to a cave diving site there will be someone hanging around who may or may not ask a question who's just kind of watching what you're doing and i always suggest you know you make the first contact to say hey i bet you're wondering what's going on here we're going cave diving and and explain you know where you're going what you're doing what you see um, because then you've created another ambassador and they'll pass it on too just as you know people that go to the ocean and have an incredible experience you know seeing a manta ray or or a tiny jawfish with his mouth full of eggs you know something remarkable with social media, you can post it, you can share it, and you have an opportunity. When people see magic, you know, and they're going, wow, you have a chance to stuff some truth in that open mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so many times people go, I just didn't know. Yeah. I just true. didn't know. But and they didn't. Yeah. And they did, yeah, I just didn't know it was like this. I just didn't know. And 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 you and, and all of us in the industry, uh, we can help to share what what we know what we experience and 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 just by doing that we can we can we can change things um you know i th sorry to interrupt no, but i just I, I just had a memory of something that happened in cayman that that really affected me deeply and and helped me understand my responsibility i was working as a as a young dive master instructor at a at a diving lodge on the east end of grand cayman it was actually pretty far away from most of the tourist traffic and dedicated kind of to experienced divers. But we had a dock on this beautiful marine replenishment zone that was protected from fishing so that the little nursery of fish could grow up and populate the waters all over Cayman. Once in a while, people would come and want to snorkel off our dock. And one day, a young man from Brooklyn, New York, on his first vacation, came down rented a mask, snorkel, and fins, and went swimming off in my lagoon. Well, when he came out of the water, he had a big branch of sea fans in his hand, like a bouquet of flowers. And he came out of the water all excited, showing his girlfriend and going, look at what I got, look at what I got. And I yelled at him. And, and then he just stood there and he went, and the color drained from his face as I told him this was a living organism that he just ripped out of the ground. And the color drained from his face and he went, I'm sorry, I didn't know. And, and as I saw how terrible this young man felt, I realized, oh my God, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have yelled at you. This is my fault. I had an opportunity to educate you and and excite you about the marine environment when I rented a mass snorkel and fins to you and I didn't take that responsibility very seriously that day. Well, I never shirked that responsibility again. And I realized how important my first contact was with people who were about to have a new experience in life. And I think if we stop yelling at people and start empowering them with information, then the result's going to be a whole lot better. And I know both of us are going to feel a lot better at the end of the day. So that changed me. That experience changed me. And I'm sure it did for him too. Well, this is, this is, this is important stuff. I mean, it's, 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 oftentimes it's really simple stuff and it's the first contact. And, and we forget about these things because we just get into our day-to-day and, and we forget, and then after somebody does something that is not healthy for the, the environment, we go, oh, that... Um, when in fact, it was actually our responsibility to make sure we set the stage for them. Right. And, and we didn't. So this is, this is a really um, uh, valuable, valuable heads up for everybody. Are we truly setting the stage 
for these people who are putting their 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 masks in a snorkel or full gear in the water? Are we really doing that, or are we just like get off the boat? You know. Yeah. <laughs> And that's individually, and that's also corporate responsibility, whether you're a dive shop or, you know, an equipment manufacturer within the industry. I think um, we all need to walk that walk and talk that talk and live by example. And that may include looking at things as radical as, you know, the diving um, annual trade show. Is this really relevant anymore? Should we be expending that kind of, you know, financial and carbon impact by gathering people all in one place like that when we can do it in ways like you and I are doing it today by Skyping each other. Um, they're hard questions, but it's time for paradigm shift. Everything has to change now if we want to survive in this world that has too many people in it. We've got to find ways to live differently. Oh, well, this is, this is the, uh, this I think is, this is one of the big resistors is that we have to change. And, and for, for me to be able to speak to people like you who are making the change and it's, and it's, and it's actually not that difficult. Um, uh, for some people, it'll be difficult if you don't make the change. And um, it's going to make it difficult for all of us, but the people who do start to make the change is going to be way easier. So what you're saying is the paradigm shift has to happen at all different aspects of the industry. What I believe is that it doesn't have to be everybody because the people who start it, they're the ones who are going to be in the best position and people who lag behind are going to be, they're going to be out of luck. You know, there's this concept, the third man concept, where let's say you go to like an outdoor rock concert or something and one guy stands up and he starts dancing like crazy and everyone's going, oh my God, that guy looks like an idiot. The second guy might get up and join him and, and then it's like two guys that look like idiots. But when the third man stands up and starts jumping around like crazy and having a good time, the entire crowd just erupts and stands up and joins in. And I think that's part of our responsibility. You know, we've got to make it, you know, cool and inclusive to be, you know, environmentally respectful. Yeah. I, you know, this This is the, from, from my perspective, this reminds me of um, Malcolm Gladwell and his tipping point. And you don't need to have the majority. You don't need to have fifty percent. You don't even need twenty percent. You just, as you say, you just need that third man. It's the, it's the tipping point, and I can feel it. It's so, it's, it's so close. You were saying um, when we were speaking earlier. You're saying uh, we're just a few bodies short of a revolution. And oh, oh, a few funerals short. Of a few funerals. <laughs> Well, I, I kind of look at it as just, we just need a few more people jumping in to to our 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 little uh, you know our our tribe you know that's it, it, I we don't I didn't realize how big our tribe was and still I, until I started talking you know doing these summits um, it's it's huge and because we can do this Skype business and we can talk without having to get at, to a show um, the the tribe is very big. And, and we're very close to making this shift and it's not going to be as pain, painful as we think it's going to be. And one of the ways I think um, it's going to be less painful is um, by talking to the kids and uh, getting that upward pressure. Uh, and you're talking to lots of kids. So tell me what they're saying. How, what's, what's going on with your, your relationship with kids? How are they responding to what you're saying? Oh, kid, kids are amazing. And you know, in all seriousness, I think the kids are growing up in a different world today. I mean, they don't have the expectations that that we did growing up. It, it, some people look at that as sad in terms of they may not live up to the economic potential of their own parents and grandparents. Um, they, they're going to live differently. They may not own a house. They may not own a car. They may be a lot more mobile and, and move from city to city to, to, to work through their lifetime, change occupations. Um, but they're not burdened by the stuff and expectations that, that perhaps our generation was. And that actually is very freeing. I, you probably felt this too when you packed up and left everything behind and moved to the Cayman Islands. It was hard to do it, but once you got there and you lived out of a suitcase, you wondered why it was so difficult um, yeah. to make the leap. So kids seem, um, they're much more malleable. I, I, you know, 
they listen and they take it in and they want to live in a different world. And I think they feel the responsibility to fix what we've kind of messed up for them um, because it's a reality. They can't ignore global climate change. They can't ignore water scarcity issues. And um, they're going to have to live differently than we did. Well, your, your kid's book, it's, a, it's about a manatee, isn't it? I haven't seen it yet. It is. Yeah. Uh, so I live um, very close to Crystal River, and, and uh, Crystal River is a place where manatees congregate in Florida. And when I first came to Crystal River, it was crystal. It was clear, and the bottom was covered with beautiful natural vegetation, and the manatees chowed down by the springs, and then they would sleep in the springs to stay warm at night. Well, unfortunately, we tend to move to the very places that we're attracted to, and civilization moved to the banks of the Crystal River. They ripped out all the riparian vegetation, and they put down lawns, and they sprayed those lawns with pesticides and fertilizer to the point where the entire bottom of Crystal River is denuded. It's sandy and covered with filamentous algae now. So a manatee that wakes up in a spring in the wintertime has to wait for a weather window when he's capable of swimming all the way out to the Gulf of Mexico through the estuaries and the sawgrass to go find food. And then he has to race back with his family to get back to the 70 degree water of the springs in the winter um, in time or risk dying of cold stress. And that's how we lose most manatees is cold stress. So they certainly, you know, get impacted by propellers of boats and other things like that. But mainly it's because they have to make this journey to go eat. So this children's book that I wrote is about this manatee, Chester, who gets a very, very bad itch <laughs> and tries to solve the itch. And a remarkable little girl named Janny figures out what's going on and decides to be that bridge to communicate with the topside world about how they're impacting the water resources. And she tries to save Chester and his friends. So it's kind of a powering, empowering story that will make kids who feel different feel like they have an important message for the world. And it'll also very quietly teach a, a solid environmental ethic, I hope. Oh, well, this is what we need is, is uh, the, more, the more kids are empowered. You know how, um, well, I know certainly with my two girls, they, they know how to um, get me to, to do things that I wouldn't normally do. And, and uh, you know, they're very, very persuasive and, um, and determined. And to empower them with this kind of knowledge and then it goes up to the parents. I mean, our generation is the problem. Um, we, we don't listen. And, and so the more we can go for the younger generation, I was, I was saying to my daughter, I don't know, we, we needed to get something. And, and she said, Mommy, we don't need any more stuff. And, and I'm just like, yes. And I said, okay, so you're going to help me. We're going to go through and we're going to clean out everything. And we're going to, you know, take it to the, to, to, the, we have a place where everybody swaps clothes and household goods. And but that's the kind of community I live in. It's great. Um, but really understanding that more is not, not better. Um, it's actually a burden. And knowing that from moving to Cayman with one bag sight unseen just showing up and look, you know, I, I know that it's tremendously freeing to have get rid of all this stuff and not have this expectation of having to accumulate. And these these kids, they I, they're I know they have their their pet things that they like to get, but uh, as you say, they they're growing up with a different expectation. And for us, who are in the know to empower them so that they can go back to their parents and say, did you know about this? Did you know about that? Uh, it, it, it can change things very, very quickly. I had, I've had a couple of things where one kid wrote me a letter telling on her dad for, <laughs> for changing the oil in the car on the grass and letting the oil drain. So she wrote me a letter to tell on him. I had another parent write me a letter saying, thanks so much. You know, ever since we saw your movie, my daughter stands outside the bathroom door when I take my shower with a timer. <laughs> <laughs> and I just love that. But you see, that's the thing. When, when, when I show the kids movies such as yours, they, um, they, they really take it to heart. 
yeah. and they 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 spout it right back. Uh, so we need to empower them to keep us in line because we're so easily just just go back to business as usual. Um, and this is a whole aspect of our industry that we really haven't tapped into. But you're tapping into, and you're a cave diver. Like, who knew that that was possible? Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I certainly didn't when I was a kid. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, Jill, I so appreciate your time. This has been amazing. Uh, you are amazing. And um, if there's any resources that you can provide to us, I want to get the link to where we can get your book. Great. Um, and uh, any, any more information on We Are Water Project, uh, we'd like to get that to all of our participants here. So, uh, Send that our way, and we'll make sure we get it to everybody involved in this this uh, this movement. Thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, join in, and thanks for everything that you're doing. It's it's fantastic work. Oh, well, thank you. Let's just keep just keep doing what we're doing, huh? <laughs> all right, <laughs> all right. Sure thing. Listen, you take yeah. care. All right, you too, Laurie.